Welcome to the intro to episode two of the open booth. The intro is taking place right here in my backyard and just wanted to share a few insights with you and a few kind of behind the scene th things that go on at the open booth. It's a relatively new podcast that it, and blog that I'm starting here and so I'm going to step into the booth. First thing you'll notice is the uh, I bring in my little tablet with me. This is how I control the camera, and it can track me, which is a cool thing. So I'm able to have a discussion, but also keep up with my camera. And usually I set up about four cameras and control at least one of them, sometimes two of them with my tablet here so that I have a little bit of extra footage. It's always good to have extra footage. But I want to give you a little bit of uh, background. So I started this channel only this year, 2024, and I want to have an opportunity to the people that I come across in my daily life and people I get introduced to um, have them come in. You can have a little bit of insight into how different people um, see the world. And the first person that was on episode one, I hope you go back and watch episode one, is a cl close friend of mine. He's in a uh, men's group that I'm in. We go to church together. And it's a great story. Um, he's got a, a really great story about his... Uh, his life up to this point. So we all have a continuing uh, life story as we go on. Um, but I wanted to really give you some reasons why I do this podcast blog and why I want to encourage you to, to watch and encourage you to share, um, encourage you to, to discuss with your friends and uh, family and neighbors and colleagues and just um, well for me what it boils down to is kind of a it segues into my business which is my business is called created photography well, I started out as a photographer a number of years ago ten years ago and I just called my photography business Matthew Brown photography Matthew R.O. Brown photography that's what a lot of photographers do and that's that's okay but I really felt that um, God was giving me more of a mission to do with my photography. So I changed the name of the photography business to Created Photography. And I often tell people that I help you remember Created Photography because I believe that every single individual has been created in the image of God. Everything you see around you has been created for a purpose. And I think that God uh, is a vital part of, and God desires to be a vital part of everyone's life. And he came to the earth uh, in, in the form of a man, Jesus, and he lived a perfect life and he showed people how to live, but he also went and took the ultimate sacrifice for those who didn't deserve it, namely all of the people who are sinners, basically all of us. And he rose again. We just celebrated Easter maybe a week or so ago. And his life continues. And he came, he said he came to give us life, life abundant, if we put our faith and our hope and our trust in him. And once you do that, once you give your faith and your hope and your trust in him, it's a natural, almost byproduct that you want to confess your sins and you want to repent of your sins and turn and, and be more of the of everything that he is. And I hope again that you would just 
take the time to watch the, the video, the first one, episode one. Take time to, to watch episode two. And it's just a discussion that we have about um, being a, a human and loving our neighbors. So uh, just take a look, listen, and enjoy and like and comment and all that. And I appreciate your time. And I'm going to leave the booth open again here. So hopefully maybe you'll come join the booth someday. Jamie Belsky, Matthew Brown, of course. Uh, welcome to the open booth. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. It's so exciting. I want to start out by giving a little shout out to where we are. So do you know anything about where we are? Hollywood Cemetery? I don't know a lot of the history. I know it's beautiful. Um, I've spent several nights walking around. But other than that, I, I don't know a whole lot of history, unfortunately. It's a beautiful place, though. I don't know a lot though. of history about it. I know that it's... Uh, like you said, for a cemetery, it's a quite a beautiful place. Often cemeteries are that way, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they for, really are. For the living, <laughs> sort of. They are, aren't they? Yeah. So yeah. Um, now, when I approached you and I said I had a proposition for you, it wasn't indecent. <laughs> I, I said that you had the option. No, this I offered this up is to you, but uh, I loved it. It was such a good idea, um, and it. Kind we'll, of goes we'll along in, with our we'll theme. Get into a little <laughs> bit understanding why it fits in with everything as we, hopefully, as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, this is, of course, the the city of Richmond over here in the distance, um, and our wonderful James River. I think you can see a little bit of the James River here. We've got uh, what is I think in all of the metropolises of around the whole country. This is one of the only ones that like flows through a city like this mm -hmm. and has like five, what is it, class five rapids yeah. like right within the city yep. and like yeah. all this stuff. And uh, of course this is Woody, um, Hollywood, not Woody, Hollywood Cemetery. <laughs> not to be confused with Woody Funeral Home. Right, so right. Getting a little plug there for no reason. Um, but yes. Actually, I was thinking because the person I was speaking with is mainly Woody. Uh, okay. He, he works here. Apparently, maybe by the time this comes out, he might have retired already because he said he was retiring within the next two weeks. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. He's probably had a long career here. On to greener pastures, maybe? Maybe. Oh. So, Remy, we are here. And uh, let me just double check this thing right there. All right. It's following me now. Move around a little bit. It's gonna yeah, follow you around. <laughs> it's fancy. So, tell me, I'm gonna actually ask you a question. Okay. Are you? And I think you've already sort of answered a little bit. Are you a Richmonder? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So born, born and raised in Richmond, mostly um, south of the James. Um, and we moved around a fair bit. Um, every time we had another kid, almost, uh, we had to move to a bigger house. So I'm one of eight. Um, so I have, I'm the second oldest, so I've got, um, five sisters and two brothers. Oh, wow. Yep. And, uh, we moved wow, around, <laughs> we moved <laughs> around about five houses that I can remember, um, until I was like 12. So we moved into the last one when I was around 12, 13. Progressively bigger houses, you mean, or just because we uh, were yeah, trying to ones that, like, worked run from the a law little, or something? we weren't running from the law, <laughs> thank goodness. 
Um, but yeah, they were not necessarily always bigger, but there were ones that fit the, the family a little bit better at the time. Okay. Yeah, so whether it was an extra bedroom here or there or some more living space, it's kind of, we were definitely chasing bedrooms though. <laughs> what's, the, what's the age difference? Between, uh, like, let's where you see. Fall yeah, um, so I'm the second oldest. Um, the oldest sibling is 36, 37. Oh, and the youngest, I believe, is 19. So it's a, it's a bit of a spread. It's a bit of a spread. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah but. And so the uh, people that are somewhat familiar with Richmond, like just you can just say the end of town, you know, that you're. Oh, like from. Midlothian. Okay. Mm -hmm. so Chesterfield. Yep, Chesterfield, North Midlothian. Chesterfield, Midlothian, Bonaire. Yeah, we moved around, but it was always within a, a similar radius. So. Did, did uh, any of your family members, I think lacrosse apparently, uh, it grew into like this hugely popular thing, especially in the uh, oh, Chesterfield Oh, did area. any of us play? Yes. No, 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 no one. Actually, we were a family of um, not really any sports at all. Oh, okay. A little bit of dance stuff musicians. didn't. Um, oh, yeah, a little bit more, I guess. Not even, we weren't even really musicians much. My sister does play piano pretty well. Um, and then we had a couple of guitar players somewhat my dad and my brother okay yep yep you're still close but, to your family now yeah um yeah my sisters and i are all pretty close um some of us are still in richmond uh some of us have moved to other locations i have a younger sister who lives in la now okay yep so i'm planning to go see her uh this year all right. yeah yeah but most of my siblings are still in richmond um i'm the one that's traveled a little bit and then has been back for now but okay. I'm the one that kept trying to leave for a while <laughs> and then kept finding, now kept why, finding myself back. Now why, why were you trying to leave? What were you trying to leave? Adventure? Just like, okay. I want to see the world. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to feel stuck. I, I was surrounded by a family who was very content to stay exactly where they were. Um, and it, it kind of made me want to, you know, get out and not feel stuck. Um, okay. Yeah. So, and it started pretty early. I, was, I graduated high school and I immediately... Um, actually, it's been a year working and saving up and then moved to um, Ghana, Africa for a year oh, wow. and taught school in an orphanage and worked there for a little while. Um, and yeah, it was, I just knew right away, I was like, nope, I need to get out of Richmond <laughs> and I guess out of the country too. <laughs> so yeah, I did that and then I came back and, you know, off and on, just kind of moved around some, traveled, definitely like seeing other places besides, you know, just what feeling was the stuck. motivation for Ghana, Ghana, Africa? Is that like mm -hmm. on the globe, the farthest place away or something? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> my parents had connections to somebody who had started an orphanage there. Um, so I knew it was an, it was an option okay. uh, without too many hoops to jump through. Okay. Um, and being 18, 19 when I left, um, it, I needed something kind of straightforward, um, but I wasn't going to the Peace Corps or anything like that. So okay. it was something that kind of fit um, and it was a really cool experience. So I met a lot of awesome people and got to teach kindergarten for a year and helped a bunch of kids learn how to read and write. So that's awesome. Yeah. Make sure that I got everything running here before we get too far. So Africa and you got family around. You're still still a Richmonder mm -hmm. right now. The, uh, the question I have is like, you, I think you mentioned it when you were, hadn't started filming yet. <laughs> you said the, uh, you said, oh, you know, I came from like a very, uh, I don't know what word you use, traditional, fundamental kind mm -hmm. of something or other. So like, what was that? Was that like a good experience? Like, can you, tell me about it. Oh, about um, it. yeah, it was, um, it was certainly an experience. <laughs> Um, we had a, a very conservative upbringing, um, and it wasn't always, um, I guess, like emotionally or mentally, like the safest environment to be in. Um, but it was certainly something I learned a whole lot from. Um, but yeah, I did feel the need to leave. Um, it was no longer a healthy environment um, for me. So I left um, the church when I was 21, 22. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was interesting. It really fostered, um, a lot of like single minded thinking. Um, so they, the church included, um, I mean, it, they, they looked for people who were like themselves. They didn't want really much diversity. It was very much like, oh, you fit in with us. So you're allowed to be here. 
um, and then they didn't really want you to deviate um, belief or I guess like thought wise from anything that was like approved. Um, so it was a, a really difficult you know place to be in because you really weren't encouraged to think for yourself or explore um, or challenge you know beliefs that other people held. It was pretty much of like this is what we think as a whole and this is what you ought to believe. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of room for, for growth or exploration um, or deciding that like, hey, I didn't fit that or that's not me anymore. Um, so those sort of things were definitely frowned upon. <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't a great environment. I don't think it was very healthy. Um, so I ended up leaving and then the majority of my family also ended up leaving um, so quite, a, quite a few years later down the road. But. The majority? So mm -hmm. some, some stayed? Um, my mom is still involved, not in that church, but she's involved in another, um, another church. Um, so she's still very kind of like similar thought processes. Like she didn't depart from like the thought processes and the theology of it. Um, she's still involved in, in a very religious church, I guess you could say. Um, uh, so like, I, I can't, if I ask a question and it seems like too much, you just want to pass it on. You can just say pass. Okay. <laughs> And of course, this is the open dialogue. So, like, if you have a question you want to push back at me, fine. This okay. isn't like a one-way kind of thing. Okay. I want to be open. So, like, if like, are your parents still together? No. Okay. No. Was was this like disagreement, like part of that, like, or was there other issues? You don't have to delve into them if you don't want to. Yeah, I I had moved out of the house when they actually split up, so I think I probably missed a lot of what was going on. Um, my mom was unhappy um with a lot of different things there were a lot of different layers um that contributed to her not being happy um but so she did ask my dad to move out of the house and then he did um and then it it got really kind of confusing because the home was actually owned by my grandmother um and she bought it with the hopes of you know this is my retirement side, plan uh mother's, mother's side okay. yeah and she bought it thinking like, oh, this will be like where I can retire and everything like that. And so when my parents split up, um, they, we couldn't keep the house. And then so she went ahead and sold it. And that kind of disrupted everyone's, you know, arrangements. Um, and I believe, let's see, I believe my mom got an apartment that year. And then she started um, kind of like just leaving. She, would, she went to like be a truck driver. And so she would just go on like long drives um, and kind of like, left the family alone for a while. Um, and again, like I was already moved out of the house by the time that happened, but several of my younger siblings were still there. Um, I think the youngest was about 10 at that point, I think. Um, so yeah, there was definitely like some, some struggle in that, in that area. The, the family stuff got a little, a little murky for a minute. Um, but yeah, so she left and then my parents split up and it seems to be like a much healthier situation. Um, you know, my dad has done a lot of like growth and change um, and he's been a lot more open-minded to, you know, kind of understanding and accepting the beliefs that like his kids have now and the fact that like we have changed and grown and we're not the same people. Um, we're not, we're no longer, you know, small miniature versions of our parents, which I think is a really healthy thing. Um, <laughs> so he's been a lot more open-minded those sort of things um, than my mom was but so yeah they're split up um, I don't really talk to my mom um, she's kind of she's off in Colorado now um, so I really don't know like too much about what's going on with her I know two of my sisters do have contact with her um, so we'll get updates every once in a while so before I get too deep <laughs> the red hair is it more people in your family oh um yeah my aunt had red hair and my brother does and I, mean, I love it that, but, you know. yeah my sister <laughs> i got a, a sister who's blonde um and a couple sisters who are brunettes um yeah so we got a little array of of different hair colors in the family <laughs> now that i got that up <laughs> so when you were uh, i'm not assuming anything you, you graduate from high school did you go to college did you stay like what happened after that yeah um so after so I graduated high school um I worked for a year I went to Ghana for a year I came back I worked for a couple years because I wasn't sure what I wanted to study 
Um, and at that point, like our parents were very much like, oh, y'all probably won't go to college. Um, so we haven't done anything to save or prepare or anything. So we can't help you go to college financially. Um, so it was pretty much on me and I decided I did want to go. Um, I did a culinary degree at J. Sarge, which is now Reynolds Community College. I did my culinary degree there and then I transferred to Johnson & Wales and did a bachelor's in hospitality management. So I've been working in restaurants and, you know, I love the whole, like, I'm here to help people and take care of people and, you know, that sort of thing. Like, that was very much kind of went along with, you know, what I wanted to be doing. And um, so I spent 12 years in restaurants. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I didn't really plan on being a chef. Um, I'd gotten it for the experience and the education. Um, but I knew I didn't want to be in the back of the house. So I was primarily front of the house only. Um, but I did love having that, that education um, and that experience of going to culinary school. It was pretty fun. Um, so yeah, I did that. And then it did take me a while um, just because I did my two-year degree and then I took some time off and worked again because um, I was like really scared of going into a lot of debt. So I was like very, very um, concerned and cautious about like taking on student loans. So I was like working and then like paying a lot of um, my college was paid in cash, like literally from bartending. I would just like take it to the bank and like pay off part of my student loan. Um, so I was really cautious that way. So yeah, at this point I don't have any student loan, which is great. <laughs> yeah. I, I know personally, it's like when I, my kids got to the age, it was partly because of like not great planning, but partially also because like we adopted a couple of kids when they were in middle school kind of threw everything for a loop, but I can't blame it on that. It's it's more like that. Mm -hmm. When our kids got to that age, they made choices, and one of them went to, to a tech school at Wyoming and learned how to do diesel technology, which I highly recommend. It's because, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people who are aging out of those trades yep. that... They need jobs, and I mean, you, they need people to work in those jobs, and uh, it's they can make a decent amount of money. Yeah, and you'd not have to have that hundred thousand dollars in student loans right. and all that stuff. <laughs> and then another one of my sons is uh, in the Air Force. Okay. And so he chose that path, and uh, he's he's home right now, and he's about to go to uh, Italy for a couple of years. So. He's sort of getting his travel in by I love it. The, the government style. Mm -hmm. I love Again, it. He kind of was like, he had thought about doing trades for the military, and some of his friends when he was graduating kind of uh, were leaning towards the military. Mm -hmm. That was kind of one of the push. I, I jokingly say I like to tell this story. It's like I, had a, I introduced him to a friend of mine um, who was in one of the services, and and he, he, gave, he sat down with my son and said, okay, well, when you think about the military and which branch you want to go into, think about it, you know, there's five, if you count the, you know, Coast Guard, but we're just going to go with four. You know, so Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. So first you start with the Marines and think about it the way you're going to sleep. Mm -hmm. If you're a Marine, you're going to sleep in the dirt, in a hole. Right. Okay? If you're in the Army... You might sleep in a, on a cot, yeah. maybe. If you're in the uh, Navy, you might have a bunk. Yeah. Because you're on a ship, most likely. If you're in the Air Force, it's probably a three, maybe four star hotel. <laughs> we did. We had permission from the <laughs> Absolutely, from Mr. Woody. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, they're doing their job. Yep. Yeah, cut. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so, yeah. He, for some reason, he chose the Air Force. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know if that was a consideration or not. I think it was more like the That's fact funny. that his friends were going into it. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. So, you're, 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 you're in service industry, and when you're mm -hmm. doing that, mm -hmm. tell me what happens. Why? Is, there's obviously some transition out of that. Oh, well, yes. So COVID was one. Um, and then I was working, um, I was working a corporate job and just really unhappy feeling like I was spending so much of my time and I'm really proud of my work ethic. And I was spending 50 hours a week working 
really hard for somebody that I just didn't, well, one, I didn't even know him because very corporate-y, you know, management chain. It's not like I knew the owner. Um, but like, I, I, didn't, I didn't think that all of my effort was being put to the best use. And I wasn't passionate so wait, about wait, what wait, I was doing. The transition. You were working like restaurants mm -hmm. and then corporate. I, yeah, so during COVID, like I left restaurants. Oh, okay. Yeah, so during restaurants COVID, mm -hmm, right. I was like, nope, it's time to get out. Like I was looking for a way out and then COVID happened and I was like, okay, this is, this is it. Um, so then I kind of went to an office job, um, had a, I mean, it was fine, it was great, you know, benefits, whatever. And then... And then I was just like, I am so unhappy. I'm I'm working so hard, and I don't I don't feel like this is meaningful work. Um, I don't feel great about what I'm doing. It's just kind of paying the bills, but it's it's so much of my life that I just felt like I was wasting it. I just felt like I was wasting my life because I wasn't doing anything that I considered meaningful. Um, I wasn't enriching anyone's life. I wasn't making it, I wasn't changing anyone. I wasn't like helping anyone. I was just doing a job. It just felt very empty. So um, I had a friend that posted something on um, her Instagram and she mentioned, she is also a bartender and she mentioned like having this really cool conversation with a death doula who'd come into our bar one night. And I was like, what is a death doula? And so that's like what sent me down this rabbit hole. And I was doing a bunch of research and, and reading and just kind of like discovering what in the world is this? Like, what is this a job? Like, I was really I was like, what is what is this? Like, what is she talking about? Because she wasn't even talking about that. She was talking about something else in her post. So what she wasn't getting, she wasn't really giving me a lot of information to go off of. So I did a bunch of research and, you know, read everything I could get my hands on. And I was like, well, this is really cool like this. If you want to talk about work that has meaning, at least for me, like this is what I consider very meaningful work. Um, really coming in and helping somebody through maybe the toughest time of their life, um, kind of depending on the situation, and really helping them smooth the path and, and journey out of this world, but in a way that is peaceful and compassionate and loving, um, you know, helping them to eliminate what's giving them a lot of stress and anxiety and you know showing them that you can you can die very peacefully um so that's something that uh, that that's what caught my eye from it all that death tool yeah death tool i okay. mean just the name just the name don't you want to like stop everything and be like what in the world is this <laughs> i have had a couple questions about it yeah so yeah. when you were young mm -hmm. I'm gonna rewind okay did you think about death oh all the time all the time yeah. um we had a lot of um we had a fair amount of pets cats um chickens birds uh hamsters guinea pigs um those are those were the main ones and every time there was a death a pet death uh we would all the kids would make sure we buried it and we were, um, you know, kind of respectful of its passing in kind of a cute little childhood way. We'd take it outside and we'd find a little piece of cloth for mom's like sewing basket and we would wrap it up and we'd dig a little hole and like bury it and put some little like markers or twigs or whatever kids do when they're burying their little like hamsters. Um, and we would like kind of give ourselves like a little pet cemetery, I guess. Um, and it was, and it was like, yeah, I, I understood like everything ends, like nothing lasts forever. So like that, that mindset was instilled very early on. Um, I didn't, I didn't like get, I mean, I guess I got sad thinking about death, but it wasn't something I avoided thinking about. Um, we didn't talk about it a ton. Um, I think my family is very much like a lot of American families where we just kind of avoid that subject. Um, we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about it, um, but I, you know, I was very, very aware that yes, we're gonna die. Everyone's gonna die, um, and so I guess I had like a healthy, I guess healthy it wasn't a, like thorough education about death at a young age, but I think it was a, a semi-healthy one. Um, and I read something, a book recently, and she was talking about how she believes that it's 
um, a really healthy thing for children or I guess anyone for the first um, dead person that they see not to be somebody that they love. And so I started thinking about that and I was like, oh, actually, yeah, that, that happened for me as well. It was my friend's grandmother and I hadn't known her or met her and I went to the viewing and we were all maybe in, maybe middle school, probably middle school. Um, and so I remember just looking at her and I was like, yep, I mean, we're all going to die. And I do think it, it might have made a difference that the first person that I saw who was dead wasn't somebody I loved. Um, so I think that was impactful, I would say. And what about the first person you did close to? Oh, well, then I had, you was know, multiple. Very, was it, it wasn't. It actually wasn't, like, um, traumatizing or I mean, I was sad, but it was, you know, people who thankfully were old. Their grandparents who have been passing. My aunt passed. Um, she died of cancer, and that death was a little bit harder. Um, I was 16, I think, when that happened. Um, and she was pretty close to us, too. Um, but, yeah, I, it was very much of, like, this is just what happens. Like, we are all going to die. We can't live expecting to outrun death. Um, so it was something I've always kind of just been like, yep, this is a thing. It's going to happen. Um, we might as well make it as, you know, peaceful and as wonderful as we can. You know, it's not going to be like a great situation, but there's ways to do it that really impact how it's, how you leave your loved ones behind. Um, so that's my hope for me. Like I have lots of thoughts about my death. <laughs> is that right? Oh yeah. I think about death all the time. I talk to my friends about death all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that, like, I would, I want my death to be meaningful. I want it to be meaningful. I want people who are there, if I am, um, I guess, lucky enough to be dying a natural death where it's not unexpected or, like, an accident or something, like, shocking, um, I would want it to be something that people look back on and are like, yeah, like we really miss Raimi. We're really sad that she's gone, but like, gosh, her death was actually really beautiful. Like I want people around me that, that end up saying that afterwards. So now I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would you want more people to talk about your life and like that, like or something in your life or your death? Do I have to choose? What if, what if it was only one? Oh, you, wait, but how would it only be one? What if, what if it was, you know, what, I'm just saying, you know, like oh, a lot gosh. of people in their life, they're like, you know, oh, this person did this or achieved that or mm -hmm. loved this or like, how often do we talk about like mm -hmm. this person's, the way they died or how they died or something mm -hmm. like that? Now, I mean, it could be different, but, um, I mean, and, and I, I would say that there's a, a fewer people that you would talk about how they died or way they died, mm -hmm. unless they died in some maybe heroic way or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I think there might be a cultural shift, um, you know, in the next few decades about how we perceive and interact with death. Um, so up until this point, it has been, you know, people don't really plan their death. They don't, they don't plan for it. Um, they don't, they don't take time to like plan the details and like curate the experience of it. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe we took a little bit more time to plan for our death, if it would be a more positive experience for both us and for the ones that we're leaving behind. So I want people to, to remember, you know, my life, obviously. Um, you know, I'm hoping to be able to touch a lot of people and be there for them in a way that they're like, yeah, I remember Remy, like, she was amazing when my, you know, so-and-so loved one was passing, and, you know, she was there, and she was amazing, whatever, sure, I want people to remember me that way, I do want people to be like, she had a really good death. Do you think you get, do you really think you get to choose it? Choose whether people remember your death or your life? Do you, I mean, in the, in the quote, kind of randomness of life, mm -hmm. how, what are the, li what is the likelihood that you will be able to choose how you die? Um, I mean, are you talking about like, as far as like natural, so say you're 
their After diagnosis. Them, yeah. Diagnosis oh, I don't think you can choose. Bad, like, I don't think you, know, you get to. I don't think you get to choose. Um, but I mean, if you get to kind of um, kind of choose the way you go, if you're for your last, how you want your last few days to go. Let's say. So if you have cancer and you're like, yep, you know, I have three months to live, and yeah, you can plan plan how you want you know those final couple weeks to look like. Um, and I don't mean like stuff you can't control. Like obviously you don't have control over the things we can't control, but we do have control over a lot of small things that really add up to make a big difference at the end of life. I know from my past life in the legal field, there often talks about uh, things called like a natural death act declaration. Uh, it's called a living will. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or having a will, having powers of attorney. Mm -hmm. These are things that uh, are said to be able to take the stress off of those around mm -hmm. someone when they're going through these difficult situations and they can't make these choices on their own. Sure. So if someone's like in a vegetative state, mm -hmm. if they've already have a document in place that says, yep. uh, you know, I, I don't want this, but I want that. I, you yep. know, I don't want extraordinary measures, but I want to be able to have food and drink through my mouth Absolutely. and things like that. Absolutely. So I tell everyone I meet. Making those decisions in advance. Yeah. I tell everyone I meet, I'm like, do your advance directive. Like, do your living will. This is super <clears> important. It, it dictates how it's going to go um, in like a broad sense. Um, it's something that I, you know, make sure all of my clients have or, you know, can get. Um, I do, it is one service that I provide as well. So I can um, help you complete your medical advance directive. Um, it was some, a certification I had to do through Virginia. Um, but yeah, I love talking to people about that and helping them sort through the ins and outs of that document, what they mean, what the questions are and what we're really going for. But I try to do it in a very conversational way. So I'm not going to read you a question and be like, What's your answer? Yes, no, fill it in. I want to know. Um, I want to know why. I want to know the why behind what you're choosing, um, so I can really help you ask more leading questions. So you can really dive into what it is and why you're choosing what you're choosing. Um, are you are you choosing um, no CPR because you know you don't know what it is, or because you've seen a really you know, unfortunate um, display of it on TV. Like, why are you choosing what you're choosing? Um, what's the real reason behind it? And like, can we make sure that the document is fully supporting what you want um, in a very thorough way? So I'm, I love it. I love helping people pre-plan for the future. Um, do it before you need it. <laughs> Don't wait to plan, um, you know, for your, your emergency situations or your end of life when it's upon you, like do it now. It doesn't, it doesn't make it come any quicker. It doesn't delay it. It is what it is. Um, but if you plan for it ahead of time, it has a drastic benefit for the entire situation. Um, I tell people it's like the most loving thing you can do for your family, for the people that you're leaving behind or the fam the family that's going to be, mm. um, shouldering, shouldering the burden and the weight of, a incident or an accident if you've done your advanced directive and they have something to go by that experience for them is going to be a lot less stressful a lot less stressful they're not gonna have to spend a lot of time you know second guessing their decisions did i do the right thing did dad want me to do this um i don't know i made the decision i was really upset when when i decided this or when i made that call um if you if you talk about it with your family and you've done your advanced directive and it's down on paper and you guys have conversations about this like regularly it will make a world of difference well so uh, i'm gonna rewind only in time a little bit okay you from your perspective how did we meet like how do i know you so oh uh, i believe we met at a 212 networking group what is 212 um that's a, a networking group um, it's kind of, there's like a lot of smaller meeting groups in Richmond and they're all under the 212 umbrella, but everyone is split off and join their own individual groups. But most of them will pop around and visit other 212 groups. Um, so we met at a 212 group. Um, I believe we are both visitors at that one. Um, and yeah, so I, I started talking to you there and you had some really good questions. Um, and then I believe I came to visit your group after that. I think we might have had coffee and talked about yep. a little bit about your work. Yep. 
yep. what you do. Mm -hmm. The um, it's uh, so let me let me say it this way: when you began this journey towards being a death doula, mm -hmm. um, did you are you part of a group or your own company? Tell me a little bit about that. Okay, um, so I am not um, part of a group. Um, Crossover Dual Services is my company. Um, I started it with the intention that it's not going to be just me, um, that it is going to expand and grow and allow other death doulas um, who want to practice but maybe aren't ready to start their own businesses um, come join um, you know, my organization so that they can practice without feeling like, oh my gosh, now I also have to be a small business owner. I didn't want that part. <laughs> Um, so I am a group, I am part of a group of other death doulas, um, networking wise, um, that we are spread all across the country. Uh, we're a really close knit group. It's called the death doula collective. Um, and yeah, we are really there to support each other, you know, emotionally and mentally and logistically. So we have, we meet every other week and we talk about all sorts of things. It's a lot of like continuing education for ourselves. We're talking about trends. Um, we're talking about things that are happening. Um, in the community and outside of the community and kind of everything, everything death doula wise. Um, and we also bring in um, like different professional groups. Um, we've learned a lot about um, the, like the way insurance works and the way um, long-term care insurance, short-term care insurance and the living benefit riders all play a part in how we can get paid. Um, for our services so we've had people other professionals come on and you know kind of just help us you know give us more information about how how their worlds and our worlds overlap a tiny bit and um, where we can support each other there now, I know the question might be asked from people watching is is it medical like not like tell me a bit about like what you do and mm -hmm. don't do yeah maybe. yeah absolutely so um, death tools are non-medical um, so we don't take the place of anyone on the hospice team, and the hospice team is pretty much the um, medical manager of the patient who's passing. Um, so if they so take somebody who's chosen to you know die at home, um, and they're at home, and they're they're going to have their hospice team involved. And I love hospice. Hospice is fantastic. I tell everyone, I'm like, get on hospice as soon as you qualify. Don't wait till the last minute. People think, oh, no, no, I'm done. not there yet. I'm going to wait. I'm like, no, like, take advantage of the benefits, the support. You, like, your final days will be much more peaceful. Um, they're going to really help manage your pain. Um, and the, just all of the support and all of the different services that hospice can bring into your home for you is amazing. Don't wait. Don't wait until the last couple days. It's gonna be hectic. Like get on hospice as soon as possible. So that being said, they are the medical managers. End of life doulas do not come in and take their place at all. Um, so we come in and we're primarily there for, you know, emotional, spiritual, and then the logistical support, care, and guidance that the family needs when the hospice team isn't around. The hospice team is gonna be there a couple hours a week the weight of caring for your loved one at home is gonna be on the family. 98% of that care is on the family. Um, so they kind of need as much help as they can get. And a lot of it is on the, the emotional side. Um, I really do talk to people about you know preparing for death, what you want, what you don't want, and then just having conversations with them, helping them do life reviews, helping them do legacy projects. Um, some people wanna leave something behind for their family. And it can be a small project, it can be a, you know kind of a bigger project. Um, but really having the time and the space to just hold for them, whatever they're feeling. This is very non-judgmental. I don't come in with an agenda. There's, I don't come in pushing beliefs on you. I'm there to meet the family and the caregiver and the patient um, right where they are. And I'm, I'm there to provide support. And because no two families or no two situations are the same, I don't have a checklist of like, oh, this is all I'm going to do for you. I come in, I'm like, what is whatever is happening i'm going to jump in i'm going to meet you where you are it can look a lot of different ways um but truly i am there for the family i'm there to hold space i'm there to be that person that they feel like has brought stability into an otherwise very choppy situation um people want to feel like they're not doing it alone so if you're overwhelmed and you're stressed out and your loved one is sitting there dying in front of you and you're like i don't even know what i'm doing somebody like me can come alongside and really provide a lot of guidance so that they feel like 
the situation is being managed and we're being all cared for and I'm not alone in doing this. I think a lot of people want, just don't want to feel alone. It's interesting that uh, I think in some ways as, as I hear what you're saying, you might say as communities and families and things like that kind of are more stressed over time and you know, like decades now that the sense of community has been stretched to the point where you know, a lot of places and a lot of people don't feel they have that support. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you talk to somewhat younger people, mm -hmm. maybe like 30 and younger, specifically maybe 35 younger, okay. the feeling of I'm on my own. Yeah. And yeah. it may be a matter somewhat of choice, but it may be a matter of the quote society we kind of live in, which is we're supremely connected by all this technology, but, but when we're you further get apart real down from, on it, like yeah, no, you're most people are just extremely disconnected. Yeah, from we're one very another. disconnected, and I think because our society is very death averse, we don't want to talk about it. We don't really want to think about it. Um, when it when it shows up, and it will show up, and when it does, the people around that individual tend to take a step back, and they're like, oh. Uh, you know, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We're going to ask, well, let me know if I can do anything for you, which is really like the worst thing to say to somebody is that it just, you can't do anything for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we tend to lose a lot of people that we otherwise would have considered like our network or our group or our community um, because they tend to take a step back because they don't know how to handle death. We don't want to talk about it. We as a culture are very unprepared for it. Um, and it really doesn't set us up for success in that way. Um, and then going back to something you said earlier about kind of um, just the way that we're spread a little bit further apart. And so the traditional um, landscape of the family, the traditional family has changed so drastically than it was you know, 100 years ago you're not going to have the same um, the same homes where you know your your parents and the kids and the grandparents all lived nearby or close or in the same house you're, you don't have that anymore and so i think we lost some of that built-in care and support that families tended to have and now we need to fill the gap because now you have more people who are unmarried um, don't have kids or maybe you do and they you know live apart very very far away um, other side of the country, whatnot, and it's just going to be harder to get back to your family if you are able to be there to support them. So end of life doulas can step in in that way as well. Um, I've had calls from people saying, hey, look, my dad's dying in Richmond, but like I live in Maryland or I live in wherever and like I can't get, I can't be there full time. Uh, I want to, but I want somebody who can be there more and who can like give me, you know, great updates and keep me in the loop, but I can't just go and be there for you know weeks on end um so i think also like our job um stresses will keep us from being there for our people who are dying our loved ones who are passing um a little bit more than than you know what we were running into decades ago so i think there's a lot of contributing factors i think it's really tough there's not one solution um but i know that end of life duelists fill a lot of gaps in the system um, in our communities and in the actual support and care that somebody's receiving at home, we can fill so many gaps. We don't take the place of anyone who's already involved. They need to be there too. Um, but I think it's, I think it's something that's really good. And I think we're going to see more and more end of life doulas in the coming decades. I think this is going to be kind of how um, we start doing end of life care and death care specifically. It's interesting. So I have a, uh... A good friend of mine that I've known ever since I was in high school and he lives in a little town in North Carolina and he he was like let's see first he was a high school teacher and uh, he taught like uh, phys ed and he taught uh, he, he was my uh, cross-country coach and soccer coach and things like that and then he uh, was went into the ministry, and then he went out of that, and he worked at Food Lion for a while. And he said he's on his third retirement now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And he said, maybe this one will stick. Oh. But there's a few little communities out there. And he lives in one of these communities where he, he says, well, every Wednesday we go out and we serve the community. And he goes to the houses in the community. And oh, wow. They, they serve their lunches and dinners and things like that. And then and he said, you know, every, you know, he has his days of the week planned out by what's going on in the community. Oh, wow. That's going to help out the community. And it's all centered for him. It's it's centered around the congregation that he's become part of. Mm -hmm. And I can see, like what you're saying, it's a way it's like uh, sometimes people have lost that. And I think you could say it about maybe in the United States, maybe 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. People were part of like a stronger congregation of people. And that congregation of people had people that would go out and visit their mm -hmm. families. But as the society kind of has changed, it hasn't quite reached out to the most uh, rural areas in the United States yet. But yeah. uh, there's still that kind of feeling of, you know, the community is your, you know, your community of people you live with and, you know, have a live, yeah, live is the word and die with you know mm -hmm. he's like well you know this church you know we have you know a funeral once a week <laughs> you know it's like yeah you know they're aging and and so yeah he's part of the process of you know visiting yeah. those people knowing who they are you know maybe their family is and living in another state mm -hmm. so it's the connection you know That's that wonderful. he's put himself into yeah and and traditionally i think in some ways that's what like a so the church I go to is like it has a deacon body, mm. and those deacons are people who will go out and visit, you know, the the congregation, and instead of like you said, when someone come, you know, someone dies in the congregation, they have, they, they don't say uh, what can we do, mm -hmm. they organize that food, you know, they organize okay, well, we're gonna do the food thing here, here's the site mm -hmm. set up, you know, they don't even ask. Yeah. You know, we're going to have food for you for the next, you know, however long as you need yeah. for your transition to, to mm -hmm. and there are pockets out there, but, I, yeah. but as society changes, you can see that there's um, people who aren't part of those communities that, that are leaning towards, mm -hmm. you know, having someone and, you know, you're obviously filling in a gap that's there mm -hmm. of, of, of a need in a community mm -hmm. um, for, and there's other people that fill in different gaps. You know, you're, yeah. you know, there's the whole when, you know, in the same small communities, when someone gave birth, there were people from the congregation. Yeah. There, but, yeah. And, you know, now they have the birth doula, mm -hmm. you know, there's someone there as the birth happens. So it's, you know, I, I know grandparents and things like that. Well, you know, I was born on the you know kitchen table. Yep. <laughs> you're kind of thing. So <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. It's good, yeah. you know, it's come around, you know. Yeah. You have yeah. people that are, you know, and people think, oh, this is a new thing, you know, to have, you know, the natural birth at home. Well, right. now it's not really. Yep. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. It's a same little with, bit retro Same with death. Way. Like, yeah, it used to be that's how we did this. And then when the hospitals got really big and, you know, living facilities got big, we, like, put them all, we put all the dying people over there. And then it wasn't something we did at home anymore. And now it's coming back to, like, now people, 9 out of 10 people, if, they, if given a choice, they say, no, I want to die at home. Um, Please take a moment to like and subscribe. I will start off this little segment by asking you a question. Okay. So I know that you're, you, this is what your passion is. Mm -hmm. This is what you want to do. You know, going forward, being a, a death doula, helping families and individuals through this mm -hmm. process. How many families have you worked with? You don't have to say an exact number. Mm -hmm. You can give a kind of estimated number. An estimate, probably around 20, 25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of, of those 20, 25, how many of them was like uh, because of like a cancer or like some other kind of thing like that? A lot of dementia. You say by percentage yeah. or something oh, like gosh. that. Oh gosh, um, a lot of dementia. Not a ton of cancer yet, but. So in the dementia case, were you mm -hmm. working more with the with the family it's than the both. individual? Both, okay. both, because at that point, like the caregivers have been on a journey. They have, they've stuck it out. This is probably something that's been going on for years and years and years and years and years. 
given the nature of the disease and they are exhausted like that is a thing that's like critical at that moment is like the caregiver fatigue and exhaustion and they feel like they're not doing enough but they're so exhausted they've maybe stopped taking care of themselves so part of what i do is i'm coming in i'm like hey look we got to make sure you are taking care of yourself you can't you can't take care of somebody else and provide support for somebody when you when you aren't taking care of yourself um you cannot pour from an empty cup so let's make sure somebody is asking you if you've slept <laughs> or if you've eaten today um and that's really my part of what i do and part of what i love so much is i become an advocate for the family the caregiver um the individual but i'm not just on one person's team i am looking at it i from a, a step back because i'm not part of the family i'm not emotionally involved in the family but i'm taking a look from um, an outside view but i can see all of the different areas and i can tell who needs the most support um, so a lot of times i'll come in and maybe the caregiver is the person i you know can provide the most support to at that time um, maybe the person who's dying is actually and this has happened is like kind of good with everything they're like i have lived a really good life and I know I'm dying but I'm in a good place like mentally and emotionally and it's the caregiver who needs all the support at that time um yeah so it kind of it kind of just depends it depends and every every family is so different they're so unique and and their their journey to what's brought them to that moment is also very very individualized and I can't pretend to understand you know everything that's led up to this moment. Um, so what I do is spend a lot of time getting to know that family, um, you know, really, really and truly being able to meet them where they are. Um, but yeah, becoming an advocate for the caregiver, I think is something that takes them by surprise because they don't, they don't realize I'm gonna be there for them. Um, they think I'm gonna be there for the person who's passing, which I am. Right, but I'm right. also very, very aware that they need a lot of support too. Um, yeah. The thing that I remember working in a field where it was estate planning and people mm -hmm. going through that process is that uh, there was a saying that my father would say, which is death and heavy stress, things like that bring out the best in some people and the worst in others mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't know which is going to be because it yeah. could be that person that you think is the steady rock who become, falls apart yep or that steady rock could stay steady yeah <laughs> it's it's very true it's very true um i think i told you earlier that i also work for a cremation company and I talk to people who've literally, you know, just watched their loved one pass and they're picking up the phone to call us. And so I deal with a lot of people who literally just moments before, um, you know, watch their loved ones die. And I see what you're saying. Sometimes it's, you know, they're just dealing with so much and there's so much emotion there. And sometimes these people are so sweet and kind and gentle. And sometimes they're very, um, they're a little bit rude, let's just say. And that's okay. Uh, I know that they're going through like craziness, but it's, it is very interesting how so much can be revealed about you um, in death. Like it, it definitely shows, it definitely shows up either you're, like you're saying, you're just like 100% this way or you've kind of flip-flopped a little bit. Um, so the first yeah. person I interviewed I don't know if you saw it, the episode, the first mm -hmm. episode. Did you did you watch any of it? I didn't watch the whole okay. thing. So he wore glasses, sunglasses the entire time during yeah. his interview because he was concussed and his like eyes are very sens sensitive. Uh, That's why he was wearing sunglasses yeah. the whole time. And he wears them indoors quite often because his, his eyes are sensitive and mm -hmm. gives him these migraines and things like that. And so it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, little... <laughs> additional common thread there common thread. and uh, when he was when the talk of of someone dying mm. you know he he saw he witnessed you know yeah because of the the bomber the there was a there was a suicide bomber 
that came in to where he was in Afghanistan. And wow. it literally like blew up like one of his you know, people in his troop. And of the, I think he said 25 people in his troop there, I'm not using the right military term, mm -hmm. like 24 of them were wounded in some way. Oh my gosh. And so that all, my point is getting back to like witnessing, actually mm -hmm. seeing, today we live in this sterile environment there where most people can go through their entire life and never see something die. Like, unless it's like a pet, like mm -hmm. you said. Um, you can go through and like, you can buy chicken in the supermarket, you can buy beef in the supermarket, you can buy all these things in the supermarket. And I bet you a lot of people think that's where it comes from. I mean, like, they don't think of an animal dying yeah. and like, because they, they, they don't witness it. They don't mm -hmm. like, it's not part of, di death is not really a part of what life is for them. Mm -hmm. You know, life is, you know, watching TikTok or watching, yeah. you know, whatever it is on social media all their life. Yeah. And they don't deal with death. They, it's not on the radar, yeah. okay? I like so, how you just said that. Death isn't really a part of our life. Well, it's not for most people. It's and really not. That's, that's a true statement. So, but for you, uh, uh, you brought this up maybe before we were on camera, which is that, uh, you know, you're talking about in the relationships that you're closest to, mm -hmm. how people might get sick of hearing about death all the time. Because, <laughs> you know, this is something that you deal with. Mm -hmm. On a very concrete, someone might know in this, ask this question. How many times have you actually seen a person die? Oh, um, so not as often as you think, um, because part of what I do is try to prepare the family to be there with their loved one when they're passing, not necessarily like with me there. So I like to work with the family enough that they feel, um, they feel really comfortable and like stable being in that moment um, without me. I don't want them to feel like they are relying on me uh, for multiple reasons. One, I can't predict the day and time of death and I can't promise somebody that I'm gonna be there for their loved one and then be stuck in traffic and not able to get there in time. So in a like, way, <laughs> I don't wanna put words get, in your mouth, but it's kind of like a dual uh, from like most people's understanding and mm -hmm. vernacular today goes back to the baby. Right. So it's bringing right. this thing mm -hmm. like literally into mm -hmm. the world, right? So maybe in a way you're more like a coach, like a death coach. A death coach. Uh, actually, I do know some people who call themselves death coaches and they do a lot of the same work. Because in um, some ways you're, you're are, not always there. Right, no. And other, like there's so many terms for what we do. So you could absolutely say death coach. Um, some people say death midwife, uh, which is going back a little bit more to like the birth doula side of things um but yeah i guess it i mean i guess some people like maybe that's what they do all doulas do slightly different things so maybe some people are like no i will promise to be there at that time i can't make that promise um and i don't like to overcommit myself and be unable to fulfill what i've told somebody that i would be able to do so i'm really cautious about not promising something that i don't have control over um, cause I can sit by your bed for 12 hours and then leave to go get something and come back and they've, they've passed. So I don't want to promise a family that I will be there at that time if it just doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, that's also interestingly enough, that is something that I like to coach and tell my families about. It's like, you do need to, um, maybe step away from time to time because a lot of people when they're passing, they, they want their loved ones to have left the room. Um, so I tell people, I'm like, take breaks, leave the room, go shower, go nap, get yourself a cup of coffee, that sort of thing. Come in, come out. Um, my grandmother was one of those people. She didn't want anyone in the room. And when she passed, she didn't, she passed while no one was, you know, sitting by her bedside. Um, yeah, it is, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Everyone has like a different way that they die. Um, what does it say? The, the old adage is kind of a wives tale thing is when a cat dies, it always finds a hiding space. Mm -hmm. And like, like if it always sleeps on the bed, it's not going to be there when it yeah. dies. It'll to be under a bed somewhere, yeah. like in some secluded area. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yep. 
So we haven't gotten really to the heart of the matter, which is, and this is in the last little segment here. <laughs> you said you don't uh, have any particular, like, quote, I don't know if you will use the word bias or anything like that, mm -hmm. but when you're thinking about death all the time, do you think about what's next? Sure. Yeah. I have and no for idea. For you, what do you think? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no clue. I'm not going to pretend to know. I have no idea. I talk about death all day. I think about death all day. I read tons of books. No one knows. No one knows. When you when you think about the unknown like that, is that how does it make you feel? Mm. Like what? I mean, what? I will say. Um, because you're, you're right there, like, like yeah. that's part of your job is, like, bringing okay. people to the, quote, doorsteps right, in right. a way. Okay, so I will say that there's, there's been enough of me seeing people who are transitioning out of this world, and they don't all do this, but a lot of them, you know, will start talking to loved ones as if their loved ones who have already died are in the room and they're reaching out to them and they're, they're reaching towards something or they're talking to them um, or they just, you can, you can understand that they feel the presence of a, of a previously past loved one in the room with them. So while I don't know what happens when we die, it seems like our loved ones come back to escort us to the other side. That is what, that's what, like, the energy in the room is saying. That, like, the loved ones come back and take take the person who's passing with them. And they kind of, like, guide them through. So where I can no longer continue to guide a human who's transitioning from this world to the next, it kind of seems that maybe their loved ones come to get them. I don't know. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is a TV show, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> is there some TV show? I mean, like those, I don't like, know what happens when we die, but like that, uh, I will say there's a lot of energy. There's like a lot of energy surrounding death. There's so much energy that like, I don't know that I can be like, yeah, no, nothing happens. Nothing happens. I don't know. That's, that's where I am right now with it. It's like there's there's too much energy and there's too much happening consistently from person to person to think that there isn't anything else after this. Um, well, get... here's here's my slight curveball. Okay. Now, this isn't like a a. I'll just say it the way that it comes out of my brain, which is, does it matter how somebody lives their life? as to like your feeling about what might happen. Like if, you know, somebody's a mass murderer right. and you know, they get the death penalty. Yeah. Do you think that's gonna be different? I don't know. I don't know. I truly have no earthly idea. Well you think about death all the time. I know. <laughs> I, I will continue to think about that. Maybe all you the don't time. really think about death. Maybe you think only about the, the point the dying? where the dying. Yeah. I mean, I think about, I mean, to the extent that I can, but no one really knows what happens for sure. So I'm, it's kind of one of those things like I understand. I've come to terms with the fact that I will never truly understand. Uh, I don't know what happens after you die, and I don't know if what happens to you will change based on the human you are and the life you've led. I don't know. But Do you I think about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think I've also come to terms with the fact that I will never truly know until I am dying myself, that I will never know what really happens. So I'm not going to get caught up in this and I'm not going to, I guess, spend time thinking about this to the extent that 
it frustrates me um, because I don't think that's going to serve me. So I'm going to bring back some of your words, okay. which are you want to be remembered on how you die. Mm -hmm. So if you spend your life towards that time and like trying to make that a, a significant moment, mm -hmm. I guess. What if the challenge is, how do you live your life? How, I mean, I ask myself this question, how do I live my life like differently if there is something I do believe mm -hmm. beyond death? Mm -hmm. I think I live my life. If this the wasn't same, everything, like yeah. if you know, because because like if you go back a hundred years, people only live to thirty years old. Yeah. Right. That's mm -hmm. like an old person. Right. Right. And now you know we're living to 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 mm -hmm. years old. We're living longer, but in the great span of existence, we're just like little dots, you yep. know. And, I feel like some days, you know, I, I get up and, you know, I'm doing the same kind of things. And, you know, a lot of people feel that way. Maybe when you were mm -hmm. corporate America, you felt that thing, you know, mm -hmm. where you're kind of doing the same thing. But what difference am I making? Yeah. What, you know, what's, what, what's, what, what am I con contributing to the overall existence? I know. That's, that was what I was struggling with. That was my question, which is why I repositioned myself to feel... Like I am contributing and I am, you know, doing meaningful work and I couldn't, I didn't feel like that before. So I don't have it all figured out. Um, I do know that I am really good. Like I'm good with, with how I'm living my life. Like I am, I'm really proud of myself for taking the risks and the chances I've been taking for seeking this and following through on this passion. Um, and I guess it doesn't, it's not going to change. Thinking about what happens after I die isn't going to change how I'm living today. Um, so I very I live be, probably because I think about death all the time. I do live very intentionally and very consciously, um, and it has greatly benefited, you know, my day to day life. And I think it's improved a lot of my relationships. Um, it's certainly improved my relationship with myself. Um, it's it's had a lot of positive benefits. So I don't have all the answers figured out, but I know that I have a lot of positive benefits from, from the work I'm doing just in my own life. Um, and that's making me a much happier person. I think that, so I'm gonna push it, like push, push the, a little bit closer to you, which is you said that you, in your work, that you help people spiritually that's the mm -hmm. word you use so mm -hmm. what does that mean to you so it does not mean religious i think a lot of people think that spiritual also means religious that's what i'm asking you so um, you know, what does it mean to you yeah so for me that is more of um like how for me personally being spiritual means that i am aware that there is more to this universe than just me and I kind of leave it at that. Like, I don't necessarily believe in God. Um, I'm, I came from a very religious upbringing background um, and I've chosen to no longer believe all of that. Um, but I am spiritual in the way that like, yeah, I believe that, that there's, there's energy in this universe that is more than I will ever be able to comprehend. And I don't need to have it all figured out. Um, so when I work with families, I do like to have an, a good understanding of their faith and their belief, if, if there is a faith and a belief system, and I want to come in and support that. Um, I don't enter any situation with any sort of agenda. Um, I'm not pushing any sort of beliefs. I'm not pushing, oh, you know, God doesn't exist, nothing. Like, I'm, I'm going to figure out what it is that you believe, and I'm going to support you in that. Um, and I think that's a really, actually, I think it's a really cool benefit I can bring um, because I can enter as a separate human without my beliefs 
occupying the space. So I leave more room for what my clients and my families believe and I can support them in that. And I think that's really important and I think that's, I think that's just really important for families, especially if they are not religious. Um, so I don't want to put words, again, I'm saying these words, I don't want to yeah. put words in your mouth, <laughs> but it, and correct me if I'm, it's more almost clinical, like clinical in the like word meaning like sterile, not like. What do you mean? What is, what is more clinical, you think? The way your approach is more like you, you want to not harm any part of the environment you're in. Mm -hmm. You want to coach and like bring the, you know, bring it to a better state. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like throwing a blanket over it of your own like agenda. Right. What you right, say. Right. I'm not pushing an agenda when I come in. Right. Correct. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's clinical in that it's, you're, you're not, you're not, uh, you know, yeah, throwing your own agenda over top of everything. Mm -hmm. You're just, it's kind of like you're taking a, a, a view from above and you're kind of seeing where everything is. And then mm -hmm. as, as you know, from your practice and from your reading and from your education, how things would, would pan out. You're, you're trying to move those little marbles around in, in such a path that of re least resistance to, to everyone uh, in a way. Right. Just I'm there, like my job is to come in and hold space. Um, it's not to come in and share, share my personal life or share my beliefs or share opinions. Um, I'm there to hold space for whatever that family or that individual is bringing up in that moment. Um, so that is, I guess that is why it sounds a little bit more clinical um, because I don't come in with an agenda. Well, I mean, see, I don't understand, I don't know enough about the whole space of, of mm -hmm. doulas mm -hmm. to know if there's other doulas who are, are, who are more like, well, as a doula myself, you know, I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, you might speak to another doula and they're like, Oh, you know, I want to, you know, push this kind of agenda or I want to, and you might be like a middle of the line kind of dual leg, you know, where you're not that, I don't know. Yeah. You, 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 you might have more experience with other doulas to know if, are all doulas across the board kind of like you, like they try to just keep that. Um, I can't speak for other doulas. Um, I know for specifically the ones I do have personal interactions with and have known um, they do approach it in a very similar way that I do where, you know, we're here to hold space. We're not here to make it about us and what we believe. So like what we think, believe doesn't really matter. Um, we're here to support the family. Um, but I, again, like, I don't know more than the doulas I know. So I can't speak, you know, on their behalf. I'm sure there's some, there might be some out there who have different belief systems and maybe they, um, have woven that into how they practice and how they serve families. Um, I know for me, I haven't found that beneficial. Well, this is kind of like in left field slightly. Left field. <laughs> left field. Um, I, my, my niece um, practices like uh, eating healthy and she does like a blog and things mm -hmm. like that. And But over the course of that, she's gotten like into like chakras and like all this other things like that that like i don't think necessarily have to do with eat. you can eat healthy and like be a nutritionist but you don't have to like go into like the chakras and different mm -hmm. things like that the, they're different fields they're different kind of like avenues that some people you know and i'm like i just don't know enough about doulas to know if there's other ones that are like you know we're going to do meditation yeah. you know, or something like that. There are a lot of doulas that have, um, they offer a variety of different services. And some of them um, are like energy healers and they'll do more of Reiki and they'll have different services that they can provide a client. Um, I am not, I don't do anything with Reiki. So I wouldn't be able to have that as one of my services. Um, but I know a lot of other doulas do have things like that. Um, so some of them do more herbal you know, natural medicine, um, not that they're like administering this in any way. This is just like, that's their background. Um, you know, they, they approach it with, you know, here's, 
um, you know, arom aromatherapies. This is my, my background. I have, you know, experience with aromatherapy and Reiki and um, or massage. A lot of, a lot of uh, doulas also do massage. Um, for me, I don't do those things. Um, it's just, I don't have a background in those and I don't feel that I'm not able to provide as much as my clients need. If that is something that they express interest in, I do have referrals. I can give them for that though. What question haven't I asked that Don't you really thought, I, that you've you thought asked, I might have asked? You've asked a lot of questions. Um, or could, I could answer, ask it slightly different. When someone asked you an odd question, what's the oddest question you've gotten or something like that? Or, uh, related specifically to this work? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter oh. to your life, to... Um, to I'm leaving the segment for you here. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have been asked a lot of weird questions, um, but a lot of them are ones that I'm quite happy to just forget uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> so, um, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I know you asked um, some good questions. I wasn't sure if you were going to focus as much on my work or if you were going to focus more on individual background history that sort of stuff and you did a pretty e i think you did a pretty good job making it an equal balance between the two which i appreciated um so yeah no i think i think you covered you covered all the good stuff <laughs> i uh i'm glad we had this conversation i'm glad yeah. that you're here and thank uh, you thank you for being in the open booth so uh we're gonna we're gonna leave it open